There's regeneration, there's hope, um, and it's beautiful in its own way too. Uh, my name is Jillian Seco. I am a book artist from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, I got my MFA in book arts at the University of Alabama and now I have a home studio and have been teaching um, in the arts at the University of Alabama. I have been involved in the arts for much of my life. I mean, even as a kid, I was always just drawing. Um, and I started studying painting and drawing when I was in my early 20s. Um, I have a, a degree in environmental anthropology and ended up being in the nonprofit world for a while, but then I decided to go back and get a book arts degree. And book arts is a kind of niche, unusual field where we make books from scratch. Um, so I make the paper for the books, I bind the books by hand, and I also do letterpress printing and other types of printmaking techniques. And so I was taking some um, just like undergraduate classes at a local college. I ended up taking a book arts class. Um, I didn't even really know what it was. Um, and I was struck by lightning. I was like, this is what I need to do. Um, I had a whole night where I was up all night just thinking about paper making and sort of realized that this was something that I needed to pursue more seriously. And for me, I'm really interested in the, the materials and um, I've like incorporated chanterelle mushroom spores into my books, um, ash from like trees that had been struck by lightning, and I've like buried linen rag underneath trees to what's called ret. It's like a decomposition process, um, and like digging up that linen, um, it was like completely covered in mycelium. Uh, it's really really cool. So I just rinsed it and put it in a mechanical beater, and then made paper out of that. Um, so. Just like that materiality aspect of it, and then being able to do actual on-site research is really interesting to me. So it's very important for me as an artist and as an environmental artist to uh, have a leave no trace ethic. And that's beyond just the rules and the laws of the national parks. Um, I don't want to take anything from the parks that um, that will contribute to like the cycle of nature. I try to source materials that are invasive, um, materials like the linen cloth that I found in the antique store that are sort of material con materially connected to the site where I'm working, but not specifically taken from that spot. I'm most inspired by natural places, natural processes, and also the way that humans interact with nature. So coming from cultural anthropology, I'm really interested in the culture of natural places as well as the science. Um, so I love um, collaborating with scientists, collaborating with um, people who are studying the culture or who have some experience with the history of a place. Um, and I also tend to read a lot around the subjects, not just the scientific literature, but also historical things. And, um, and I've been talking to people on trails and that has been very inspiring to me too. Um, just people who have walked by me as I was drawing on Limberlost, talking about um, their experience from like 25, 30 years ago being on the same trail. Um, so being in a place and spending like extended time in places and exploring sort of the small things um, really inspires me, I think, as an artist. I'm working on a project called Hemlock, and it's a long-term book project that I'm not gonna finish right after this residency. Um, I usually make editions of what's called artist books, and an artist book is the book is the object of art in itself. Um, so. Um, instead of it being like an illustrated book or something like that, it is an object of art. Um, and so this book is going to be about the hemlock trees and the hemlock woolly adelgid, which is an invasive insect that has been threatening um, the trees all across the East Coast. The invasive insect hemlock woolly adelgid is from Japan originally, and um, it's killed off about 95% of the trees in Shenandoah. Um, but there's also a spot in Alabama, which is the southernmost reach of the trees, um, that has not been affected by the adelgid yet. So I know Limberlost Trail exists because Addie Pollock um, purchased the hemlock trees um, to save them from logging. And now um, 
if we walk around Limberlost Trail, you'll see that the majority of them have died. And so you'll see old growth hemlocks that are now stumps or logs on the ground. Um, so it's been very interesting to be here and sort of research the site as a counterpoint to what I see in Alabama. People that I've talked to have been sort of shying away from uh, talking about the dead hemlocks. And um, people are always like, oh, but there's these flowers and there's these live things and there's these birds. And that's wonderful and beautiful. But I've found some beauty in the actual dead trees that are on these trails. And just like examining them and the way that they decompose um, is really, really interesting to me. And, uh, you know, it's sad, but there's also the cycle of life that's happening. And there's lots of live hemlocks that are being treated in the park as well. So um, even though there's not really old growth hemlocks as much in the park anymore, um, there will be. So I hope to communicate both a feeling or like a sensation of connectivity with the place. Um, I want people to get a sense of the place by experiencing my artwork. Um, um, and especially in um, the case of environmental issues like the invasive adelgid, um, I think it's really important to do some educational pieces around the art. Um, so not just to have a piece of art that people can interpret as they please, but also to have some interpretive materials that go along with it um, so that people are clear on what the subject matter is and also maybe to some extent how they can get involved or learn more about it. When I was talking about my own art as well, like this sort of spark of connection with some of the people I was speaking with, um, especially when I talked about my mycorrhizae project, which is about underground uh, root and fungal connections and mentioned like my inspiration was just walking around in the woods and sort of having this recognition that there's this whole world, this whole network underneath us that we don't see. Um, and I think that people really connect with that um, sort of aesthetic understanding or that emotional understanding of nature. And I think that that's what makes people want to conserve. The symbiotic relationship in some ways is easier because you have these two things that we both we see both of them as good and beneficial right to the the life of the forest but in the case of the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, even in scientific literature they use words like attack and invade as though the adelgid itself had some kind of agency in this um, when in fact it's just this thing that we brought over you know we're the ones that have caused this to happen and so i think the important thing for me is to emphasize that this is human caused ecological change um, not that the adelgid itself is like evil or, or nasty and and you know in the end there is a lot of change that we're causing but that there is some kind of like hope and regeneration and that there's lots of people um, and could be even more people um, behind the effort to to save the forest and conserve what we have. I have learned an amazing amount here <laughs> and completely reframed sort of what I was gonna do with this book. One thing I learned is, again, that hemlocks decompose in a really particular and interesting way. And uh, I've taken a video of um, these like sheets of bark. It's like uh, layers of bark that you can almost flip through like a book. Um, and so that's been inspiring for what the form of my artist book is going to be. Um, and then I was able to go out with uh, biologist Dale Meyerhofer, who's been working in the park with hemlocks for 15 years um, and learn how to treat hemlock trees with imidacloprid, um, which is a systemic pesticide. Um, and if the trees in Shenandoah are not treated, they actually are very likely to die. So it's incredibly important, this work that they're doing. I kind of just have gotten a better sense of what a forest looks like um, after the impact of the hemlock woolly adelgids has sort of passed and is, is like now being treated in a long-term way. Um, so I have a lot to bring back to the folks in Alabama. Um, who are just kind of starting this journey. I'm just very grateful to the Shenandoah National Park Trust for supporting the Artist in Residence program. Um, it's just such an amazing way for artists to be able to spend an extended amount of time outdoors in nature in the park, um, getting to know it. Um, and for many artists that come here, you don't leave your three weeks with 
a body of work necessarily, but you have the materials and the research and the um, kind of data collection that you need to continue your work um, as you go forward. And for me, um, just being here and then a being able to go back to Alabama after washing and scrubbing all of my stuff so I don't bring the <laughs> adelgid back um, is going to be amazing uh, for me continuing um, my work as I go forward. Hi, I'm Jessica Cochalone, and I am the Executive Director of the Shenandoah National Park Trust, and we are proud to be the philanthropic partner of the Shenandoah National Park. Our mission is to invest philanthropic dollars in initiatives and programs that ensure Shenandoah remains the crown jewel of the national park system, an economic driver for the region, and a national treasure for all to enjoy today and tomorrow. If you are interested in learning more about Shenandoah National Park Trust and supporting this program, please visit us online at snptrust.org.